Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to join us in our celebration of the 50th birthday of the Department of Computer Science. But not only that, also the 60th birthday of the Canadian Information Processing Society and the 112th birthday of Grace Hopper. <laughs> Hopper is, but we'll go into that a little bit later. Um, so let me first start by saying, uh, we start this event by respectfully acknowledging that University of Regina campuses are located on Treaty 4 and Treaty 6 territories, the ancestral lands of the Cree, the Soto, Dakota, and Lakota nations, and the homeland of the Métis. So, let's see what the technology works. Someone in your program about how in 1970 Larry Symes became the first member of the department and the head of computer science as well. And until 1971, the computer science classes were offered by the faculty of administration and the department of mathematics. This was a little more difficult to identify who was the first grad, who were the first graduates from the department of computer science. So we're still working on that. <coughs> So in 1973, as director of the Computer Center, uh, Dr. Symes ordered the Xerox Sigma 9, the university's first time-sharing computer. So the first graduates from computer science, uh, I'm going to say about 10 of them, convocated in 1973 and 74, spread out across the three different uh, convocations. So from those 10, in this semester, we have well, there it is. Okay. 687 undergraduate students, 163 graduate students, 21 PhD, and 142 master students. So it's a bit of, a bit of growth from those first 10. So I want to also mention HIPS because the Department of Computer Science has a, a strong relationship <coughs> with HIPS over the years. Uh, so Brian McGuire, Alan Law, and Larry Simons were all involved in the leadership of the local KIPS organization. And also Larry Simons was the national president of KIPS. And in 1975, in June of 1975, uh, we hosted the KIPS national meeting. Does anyone remember June 25th of 1975? <laughs> Got a little bit of rain that day. So Grace Hopper, so she's known variously as a mother of computing, but she's also for, for almost everybody, she's attached to the phrase, it's easier to ask forgiveness than to get permission. So I know where that came from. And she also said, please cut off a nanosecond and send it over to you. And I don't think that needs any further explanation. So Computer Science Education Week has, has been running since about 2010, a little bit before that. It started in the States, and now it's an international affair. And uh, so this is from this, week, this year's uh, map of activities for Computer Science Education Week. And if you look over there by Regina, there's a little bit of a clearing, and you can see some dots. <laughs> I asked for special status for our birthday party tonight, but uh, I hadn't got, I didn't. Somehow they missed the opportunity. Um, so I wanted to let everyone know that we have, we're working, still working on some stories and pictures and so forth from the history of the department at this website, ur50cs.urigina.ca. So if you're 
inclined to look at some pictures there and maybe identify some familiar faces, please do that. And leave me some comments or send me some, send some email. And then I wanted to point out the University of Regina Faculty of Science webpage. We have a, the, the 50th birthday there. And so we're working. We'd appreciate your, we appreciate your support tonight, and we'd appreciate uh, for further support for scholarship and outreach activities that we're undertaking. Some of which help to engage Dave Plummer in computing on Saturday mornings here at the university. Anyway, enough uh, introduction. I realize I didn't say who I was. My name's Daryl Hepton. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science. I did my bachelor's here and my master's in 88 and 91. And I came back in 2001. So please let me call on uh, Corey Butts, Associate uh, Dean of Research for the Faculty of Science, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Daryl. On behalf of Doug Farinet, the Dean of Science, it is my pleasure to welcome our speaker, David Plummer. In 1994, David received a Bachelor of Science High Honours in Computer Science from the University of Regina. He was born and raised in Regina and now lives in the Seattle area. David worked at Microsoft, where he served as a developer and a development manager on every major operating system from MS-DOS through Server 2003. However, his love for computers began here in the computer labs at the University of Regina on Saturday mornings. Please welcome David. Regina General Hospital here in town, 
where my mom was an operating room nurse. My dad owned and operated Thomas Hardware over on College. The store was just down the alley from our house, as was my grandfather's workshop. And so every day from the age of five on, on up, especially in the summers, I would wander down and hang out at my dad at the shop, the hardware store for a while, and then visit my grandfather at his shop. Not only did his shop feature a Coke machine, he had the key, and sometimes he'd open it up and grab us each a bottle. As a little kid, being able to open the Coke machine seemed to me to be the ultimate in power and privilege. <laughs> Between the hardware store and grandpa's shop, I spent a great deal of time hanging out with folks who were just busy fixing, <laughs> inventing, and building things. Uh, I'm a little I'm just a little kind of little And I think that was formative. Of course, what was hardware for them would turn out to be software for me, but the core instincts are very similar, I think. Several years later, when I was 11, a little able to venture a little further from home, I made my way into the local radio shack. There, out of the boxes the not yet set up, sat something I'd only ever heard of, a computer, a TRS-80 model one with 4K. When I asked what I was going to be ready to use, they said they weren't sure how it got up yet. In a move that kept somewhat of a theme in my life, I just offered to set it up for them, even though I clearly had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> they must have felt I was precocious or entertaining enough to humor with their expensive system because they said, sure, kid, had a shot, and they left me to it. In all honesty, it wasn't that much different from connecting a component stereo, except Tandy, in her infinite wisdom, used the exact same 5-pin round dip connector for video, power, keyboard, everything. But I still managed somehow not to blow it up. It was to be my first experience with dust blinking lights, and I loved it. The more LEDs something had, as far as I was concerned, the better. Once up and running, I got AP performed a Turing test on the machine by typing English commands into the basic interpreter. It failed miserably and responded only with SN question mark, which I decided must have been spelling error. <laughs> Later, I figured out the syntax, but at that age, I didn't know what syntax was anyway. I didn't get very far that first day, but I walked out over my bike down there every Thursday night and Saturday morning, and the manager, Brian Patton, let me key in the basic program that I dreamed up in elementary school the days prior. I didn't even save any of these really programs with the cassette, and keyed in something new every time. I initially had no idea how limited the interpreter was, but I learned quickly. There were no books on how a kid could learn Zeddy to get some way language, at least not that I could find. And while the Radio Shack guys were uh, friendly, initially they knew less about the machine than I did. And as gracious as they were about letting me exploit uh, Regina's Thursday night shopping policy, I couldn't spend all my time sitting on a stool in a corner of a retail store. And that is the moment that I discovered the University of Regina. I found a convenient shortcut through the park near the old power plant that could take my bike from my house to the university in just about 10 minutes. And there, on the first floor of the lab building, I think in 115, is Minerva. Or maybe it was Venerva, or maybe there was both. Somebody here will know. But for certain, they had a PDB 11, and I discovered that on Saturday mornings, kids were tolerated. I don't even know to this day if somebody was actually opening the lab up to kids, or security was just light on Saturday mornings. <laughs> <laughs> And the PDP itself had the most blinking lights of all, and the hello prompt of what I think was RSTS awaited. My mom looked into it a little further for me, and found that there was actually a class you could take in that lab, on that very machine, and the public was welcome. We signed me up immediately, and I'm afraid to say I couldn't figure out exactly who organized that class, but it could well have been Dr. McGuire. I think I remember that Dr. Cullimore from the science department was somehow involved as well. I'm still a little a bit more about that class because it really entailed the typing in of a giant Snoopy Ascular calendar. Uh, but on one hand, I learned very little, little, very little about programming, but lo and behold, by the time I was done, I was very proficient with a deck writer 110. I knew what to do with the PDP 11 login prompt. I even had my own account where I could save and retrieve my programs. So I used that knowledge to continue coming in on Saturdays to tinker while the summer lasted. Because they were so new and rare, access to computers would be scarce for a while. Prices would come down over time, but my family just didn't have the thousands of spare dollars it took in those days. I would continue to rent, beg, or borrow whatever computer time I could get. As much as we might disdain the basic language, at least it's reasonably portable, especially if you're going from one Microsoft interpreter to another. But even if you wound up in Apple Basic, you weren't totally lost. So those little basic masterpieces could be adapted to wherever you managed to get access. And then, after renting a VIC-20 from the public library for a couple of weeks, my parents surprised me with the news that we would be getting Commodore 64. And I don't think it was anywhere within the family budget, so it was really a stretch for them, going out on a limb. I wasn't especially familiar with that computer going in, but in retrospect, it was the best possible choice for me, and it was literally the last thing anybody had to buy for me. It came with a machine language monitor that allowed me to get my feet wet. In those days, a quick test of how fast the computer was was just to increment the screen color register in a tight loop and see what the screen looked like. 
In the basic interpreter, you've got colorful flashing on the screen, but in machine code, it's different. The electron beam on the screen barely advanced an inch on the scan line before the color changed again. You could see the speed, it was intoxicated. Did I just say that one, one megahertz machine was intoxicated? <laughs> it really was, though. The leap in power and speed from basic to assembly language was several orders of magnitude, not just one. So armed with the excellent numbers for a programmer's reference manual and pad of graph paper, I set up to revolutionize the video game industry. In truth, I was something similar to Galaga, but with fewer attackers. By this time, I was smart enough to save programs, and this was important enough that I was able to make my first backup, except I screwed up. Floppies did not come pre-formatted in those days, and I managed to format the original. And I'm still a little bitter about that, but ironically in truth, uh, that moment is so now burned into my brain visually that I have a pretty good mental image of what the game looked like, better than if I would have saved it. <laughs> You'll notice I've been saying machine language and not assembly language, and at first it truly was, as a C64 monitor that I was using didn't have an assembler built in. It certainly didn't have labels or line numbers, so if you wanted to insert an instruction, you'd have to jump out the free memory, do your work, and then jump back to where you were. It was the true definition of spaghetti code, something you don't hear much about these days, but it was a real thing on early projects written in unstructured languages. The year I turned 16, I finally met a kindred soul who was doing the same thing as me, filing away the long summer months coding a Sunday language in his mom's basement on his Commodore 64. His name was Chris, and he knew a lot more than me, so I spent the rest of the summer standing over his shoulder, watching him code, and I learned by observation. He had actually lived across the street for many years, but it was a busy street, and I wasn't allowed to cross it. So <laughs> our meeting had to wait until I was driving age. <clears throat> In high school, the only class I truly enjoyed was computer science, and I was fortunate to have a dedicated computer science instructor in the aptly named Mr. Bright, who was not only a great teacher in general, but also a knowledgeable computer enthusiast in particular. Not unlike a Microsoft interview question, the assignments he came up with for us often had trivial answers that again could be vastly improved. For example, one assignment was to find prime numbers. If it worked, you passed, but to get a great mark, it had to be fast, too. And just as you see some kids training for football for hours after school to be the fastest, Mr. Bright would keep the loud work for us and we'd hang around and optimize our crime scenes. By late high school, however, I sort of drifted away from, from computers for about a year or two as I worried about cars and girls and whatever else teenage boys care about. You'll notice I didn't say I was particularly worried about school, which I was not. In fact, at some point in 12th grade, I just stopped going. My kids would still ask me, how did you drop out of high school? Wasn't that a huge decision? Why did your mom even let you? And it turns out that dropping out of high school is one of those things that happens kind of slowly and inexorably, not overnight. You miss a class here, a test there, and pretty soon you're, pretty soon, you're working a night shift at 7-Eleven, staring down a shiny blade at 4 a.m. <laughs> and that's where the call to save me came out of the group. I'd been drifting through life for the last year or two, not in school, working in warehouses and retail, and I had no grand plan. That's when I got a call from John White, who was also a couple of years my senior, and a true computer savant. He had gone to my high school where he was well known as a super genius. I'm still literally doing the odd project to reprobate stuff that I saw John do on 8 bit computers in the 1990s, but he really was that gifted. And now he was working for a big video game company in Ottawa, and they were desperate for good programmers, programmers and did I know anything about the Commodore 64. When they asked if I could handle video interrupts and multiplex and sprite art, or I confirmed that I was indeed well versed in such topics which is my way of saying, I'll figure that out before I get there. <laughs> and I've done that too many times for camp. But I watched Chris do similar tasks, and I knew how the general idea of work. So I sat up late into the night, and I got a rough demo up and running. I made a VHS demo tape of the uh, video output from the Commodore 64 the next morning, and overnighted it to Ottawa so that I could await their judgment. Which was that I should load all of my belongings into the trunk of my old Pontiac and head east if only we could agree on a dollar or not. And I could tell they were desperate, so I really reached for it. I told them I would need at least six thousand dollars to rate that game over the course of four months. And yeah, that works out to about nine dollars an hour, but it seemed like a lot of money at the time. I moved into John's attic in Ottawa and basically lived to work anyway, cranking out the game code in 6502 assembly. When I returned to Regina, Chris and I set up a small video game studio in the offices of Ricker Warehouse in the industrial area, and we contracted out to companies like Electronic Arts and Accolade. Eventually, I was making decent money under my new contracts, and things were looking up. <coughs> I still hadn't even finished high school. About that time, a friend took me on a tour of the U of R and the adult entry program. Unfortunately, I didn't even meet those blocks requirements if I needed a number of classes I still didn't have. 
Rather than pursuing a GED, however, I drove down to the local high school to chat with the principal. After all, I wasn't a kid anymore. I was a professional young man. I should be able to handle high school. Even though I was 21 years old, Mr. Grisina kindly relented and let me in. It's not just that being in high school at 21 years old is a little surreal. For example, one day I was waiting outside my car for the girl I was dating, and somebody let her know that her dad was there to pick her. And so, seven years into my high school career, I finally qualified for the restricted adult entry program here at the U of R. I had to take Math 90 and 91 and some remedial classes, but once I got into the swing of things, I turned out to be a pretty good student. I have never been one of those autodidacts that looks down upon higher education as too removed from practice. I was always the opposite. I craved whatever knowledge they had acquired, and I wanted to make it my own. Even a little jealous that they had information I did not. But I was always fascinated by links to the practical. I remember sitting in a lecture hall and learning about Shannon's theorem. I pulled out a piece of paper and I took a quick math on a telephone signal to noise ratio show and out popped the number that was surprisingly close to the maximum speed of the better motor of the day. And I love it when a theory predicts reality like that. The grade field on transcripts back then was only two digits wide, and there were two classes that came close to getting 100% in, but I never did it. In CS200, I got 100% on every assignment and every test. And I can see the look on my son's face that says, oh, my dad's going to tell the JSR story again. <laughs> I went into the final exam with a 100% average, and I got 100% on all the programming questions. But then I made my one mistake. There was a large true or false section, and one of the questions was, for every JSR, there must be an RTS, which I said, well, no, every JSR needs an RTS. Problem is, of course, that many JSRs can share the same RTS. So while I've been arguing for 30 years, and it depends on how you read the word the question, I still got it wrong. <laughs> not there. <better, not> <laughs> My other 99 came in one of my favorite classes, CS300. That was our assembly language programming class. Better yet, it was all done on a PDP-11 instruction set, and we might have been using the same PDP-11 that I'd been using as a kid, but I couldn't tell for sure. Our major final product, project in that class was to write a game for the PDP-11 that ran on terminal. Blackjack and Tic-Tac-Toe were common choices, but I wanted to try a video game. I got a hold of a VT220 reference manual, and I figured out the various weird and special modes that are supported and put them all to good use for a version of the old arcade game Omega Race. It opened with a scrolling title intro screen like the Star Wars movie using a special double high character mode and it did character based graphics. It had 2400 and 9600, but in my mind it was super impressive that it ran at all, but it wasn't something to get everybody twice for fun. <laughs> my other two favorites were CS405 graphics and CS440 languages to it. In my languages class, we took Prolog and Lisp and Ada and a number of languages, languages that I would likely have never touched if not for that class. As cool as functional programming was, though, I was very enamored with Ada because I always felt like if it compiled, it would probably run. That's kind of how I feel about Wilbur and C Sharp, my current favorite language that I never get to use. In the graphics class, we started with the very basics and we worked our way up to shading a simple house model, but all from first principles. In other words, we weren't learning how to use OpenGL, we were learning how to write OpenGL. And to me, that's been a key difference between higher education and a trade school system. Somebody has to write the language and the tools and operating systems that other programmers use. Meanwhile, back to home in the 80s, I had a Amiga, not a PC. In fact, I wouldn't even own a PC before I went to Microsoft, other than old Keystart Phillips 286 that I literally pulled out of my father in dumpster to learn Excel. I really enjoyed the 68,000 instruction set, as it reminded me of the PDB-11 in a way, and it still was made for humans to code in, unlike the RISC chips a few years later, were really designed for the compilers, not for the coders. I was working my way through the U of R, so on the side, I started to write an app for the Amiga. It wasn't a big market by any stretch, however, so I went commercial from the start, rather than shareware. My first success was a program called HyperCache. The Amiga operating system, while advanced in the sense that it supported preemptive multitasking and similar features long before they became commonplace, completely lost, lacked disk caching. The difference with and without my software machine was night and day that became quite popular. But by popular, I mean to paid my way through school, but I was still driving a rusty 75 money car. So hundreds and then thousands got me, but never millions. I drew up the cover art in Corel Paint, and we had a production run by a fellow down at New York's print services in the admin building. So each day after school, I had a little bundle of hypercache under my arm. And on days that I couldn't make it, my girlfriend, my wife, Nikki, could be found shrimp wrapping software between her own classes. During my second last summer in college, I was working at Saskatel and not really enjoying it. I still didn't know what I was going to do for a living ultimately, and while I knew it would be programming, I didn't know if it would be embedded microwave oven code or video games. I had no idea. Each day at lunch, I'd eat in the Cornwall Center food court and I'd read a book. 
On one occasion, I wandered into Cole's bookstore and I grabbed a copy of Hard Drive, the story of Microsoft and Bill Gates. As an Amiga enthusiast, Microsoft was only kind of the enemy, but I still was interested in learning more about the company and the story behind it. Once I got into the book, interested is not the word I used to best describe it. Enthralled, perhaps, or entranced. I don't actually know. But certainly fascinated by the people, the projects, the environment, and how they got things done. I knew immediately, and with great certainty, where I wanted to be and what I wanted to do with my life. The only problem, however, was that I was sitting in a giant formal food court, and Microsoft was, at the time, receiving over 100,000 job applications a year. They did recruit a bit at a Waterloo in Ontario, but suffice to say the U of R was not really on their radar at the time. The odds of even getting an application in Delhi seemed very remote. So what to do? My hypercache program, like most software packages of that day, came with a little registration card that you could fill out and mail in so that I could notify you with upgrades and so on. I would come home after school and type in the stack that arrived in the mail into a little database that I read. Fortunately, even though it was barely 1990, I had included an email field on the field on the forum, so I went through digging for anyone that I could find with a Microsoft email address. I found two or three, and one fellow responded, Alistair Banks. He's now in the UK, so I've still never met him in person. But I remained contact with him, come remain in contact with him to this day, and I sent him thank you notes on my major work anniversaries. I asked him where or to whom I should send the resume to maximize the chances of it being seen, and he gave me the greatest gift you can give to an aspiring graduate, the contact email of a few managers that were actively hiring new developers. I put together my resume and fired it off directly to them. Within a few weeks, I had a phone interview with Ben Slifka, who ran the MS DOF development team, and who would later start the Internet Explorer project. Although even the phone screens with Microsoft were rather technically demanding, we didn't have to code live on the phone, so I could hide my lack of x86-specific experience to some extent. I managed to make an interview loop at Redmond in February, um, and Microsoft, to its great credit, takes care of everything. You just show up. The legal department does the visa work, for example, and they make all the travel arrangements. Although they assumed that being Canadian, I would fly from Toronto, because all Canadians fly through Toronto. <laughs> Microsoft interview loops used to be famously grueling. You spend the entire day there. You start with an HR interview to make sure you're sane and bathed, and if so, then you're off to a series of five one-hour coding interviews where you stand at a whiteboard and you answer brain teasers and write C and assembly code until you can't go any further. They push you until they stop and or they break you, and then depending on how those first five go, you might make it to the as appropriate interview, which is the hiring manager. The answer is Boolean at each of these steps, hire or no hire. There are no maybes. You only get to the final interview if everyone else has said hire, generally. Since the team must be fully bought in on who gets hired, it's not just up to the boss. The coding problems are simple tasks that you can fit onto one whiteboard, like how to reverse a double link list, or how to count the number of bits that are set in a word. Attempt to factor a prime, that sort of thing, where there's an obvious and trivial approach that can be refined and optimized. You want to see their thought process, and you want to see what they consider good enough. Take the approach or the case of counting the number of bits that are set in a 32-bit word. The naive, and a naive approach is to or it with one, increment the counter, shift the word, and repeat. Do that 32 times and you've got your answer. But that can be improved. You can stop as soon as the remaining word is zero, right? And as the interviewer, you watch to see if the person picks up on those little optimizations and makes you on the problem. <coughs> but what about long runs of zero separated by ones? That seems like a waste of time. Well, it turns out that instead of adding with one, you add the number of cells less one, and that way you only do one operation per actual bit that is set. If three bits are set, you only do three tests. In other words, there's the simple answer, the fast answer, and the smart answer gets yourself higher answer. I learned quickly that I made it, and right after final exams finished here at the new bar, I threw down. After a couple of hours of new intern orientation, they gave me an office, an account, and a copy of the Madison Assembly. From there, it is sink or swim. Remember, it's still 1993. There's no open web, there's no Google, or Wikipedia, or Stack Overflow. I've never written a line of x86 code in my life before, and I expect me to be productive immediately. I'm sitting in an office with a chair, a desk, a USB C, and a network cable. But I can't overstress these straight to the fire part. It's not like it's asked out where they give the intern a token task that he can't screw up and won't cause a problem when he inevitably does anyway. In contrast, Microsoft has me working on the core code base for new features for MS DOS, which is a multi billion dollar business. Bill Gates has us over to his house for a barbecue to talk about it over a few years, and I'm supposed to add it, this is all normal for me. <laughs> well, they take their interns seriously. There were perhaps only five or six developers in total on MS DOS, and most of that team was feverishly rewriting the hard disk compression engine to not use a hash table, which it turns out that the Stack Corporation actually somehow get a patent on, and Microsoft lost a lawsuit over. 
Thus, it's me and one other intern at that level who are responsible for pretty much every new feature in the operating system, including the new setup program. To ease into things at least a little, my first task was to make this copy single pass. At least it's a standalone app that I can assemble and build, something I get my head around and tinker with. The prior implementation was limited to RAM only, and so it would require many swaps to complete a disk copy. The hardest part is finding a safe place to store a temporary copy of the floppy disk when there are a million different possible system configurations. Remember, you accidentally store a temp file on a metered network share, and that's a class action lawsuit. If you assume the C drive is a hard drive, perhaps you crash a helicopter, an ATM, or a refrigerator. Who knows? The biggest trick is that's the biggest trick. You're coding for a billion machines. It's like you're building one bowl to be released into an infinite number of china shops, and you've never seen any of them before. If it can break or go wrong, it will somewhere. It's truly a different philosophy of coding. My next task was to limit the RAM use of the double space compression program. As you might recall, memory back then was limited to 640k on MS DOS, so everything you could move above that barrier meant more free memory for useful things like applications. And the x86 has an interesting feature where your segment and your oscillators can add up to slightly more than one megabyte. Basically, your pointer wraps around and start a memory pin. Sometimes. It actually depends. If the A20 keyboard line is high, then the pointers wrap around back to low memory. If the A20 line is low, then they point past the one-meg boundary. I use that ugly hackery to move the engine up above the one-meg boundary and stub every function call into it with this funky pointer map and exploit the CPU by freeing up a ton of low memory. And that's the kind of thing that actually got magazine cover stories back in that day. Next was to attempt to save the company money by putting the upgrade on a single floppy disk. Well, MS-DOS 6.2 might ship on four or five disks, but if you already have MS-DOS 6.0, what I did was to write an upgrade system that patched the 6.0 binaries in place with the deltas to make them into 6.2 binary and discovered that all of those deltas combined were still small enough to fit on a single floppy. Thus, we were able to offer the MS-DOS 6.2 step-up upgrade on a single disk, having a saving several dollars per copy, multiplied by tens of millions of copies. A single little project by intern generated millions in savings. And then the real work began. Because of my experience with HyperCache, they pointed me to write the smart drive cache engine to be more generic and support all kinds of block-level devices, most notably the CD-ROMs that were just coming into the market at the time. Caching made an epic performance difference on CDs. All of this work only took three months, which I still have trouble believing when I look back at it. If I had to schedule that amount of work, work if, if I had to schedule that amount of work now, I'd be looking at a year. But it's amazing what you can accomplish when you're young, broke, and hungry. <laughs> Even though I felt I'd done a good job, there was no guarantee that an internship would ever translate into a full-time position. When my summer was over, I came back to a job to go back to class and hope the phone might ring one day. Then I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing when that offer all coffee offer call came in that fall. I was being offered a full-time software design engineer in position in Redmond with complete relocation benefits, visa and immigration assistance, the works. And the salary? Are you ready? You've already heard of Microsoft Millionaires of the Euro. No, it's 35000 a year. That's all they were paying, but I didn't care. I didn't negotiate. Whatever it was, it was enough. I wasn't in it for the money, even if I thought I was at the time. It wasn't until the UPS drivers went on strike that summer that I found out they were making 50% more than I was. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't really care, and there were these other things called stock options that uh, were better okay in the end, so don't feel bad for me. <laughs> what I found especially interesting was to compare notes with the other new hires from places like MIT and Harvard. They got the exact same offer I did, right down to the penny. I don't know what it cost to go to Harvard, but I bet you could save 15% or more, especially with the UR. <laughs> Microsoft again suggested that when I fly down, I come from Toronto because they'd been having trouble in Vancouver. Too many Canadians coming down through there to work for Microsoft all of a sudden, and they were starting to push back hard on the visas. Toronto being a little silly, we agreed to compromise on Calgary. My fiance and I flew in, and I got taken into the big glass room for the immigration interview. As she watched from the outside, she could see him flailing his arms and turning red in the face and yelling. Clearly, I was headed back to Canada in my Microsoft dreams. We're not to be. But what she didn't know, because she couldn't hear anything, was that he'd already long since stamped and approved my work visa. He was upset because every time he printed his form in Word, he would print the blank piece of paper at the end. It was wasting paper. It was a bunch of Microsoft. He wanted me to fix it with <laughs> That May I flew back one weekend, convocated from the U of R on Friday, got married on Saturday, and then promptly relocated to the U.S. on Monday. <laughs> and by the way, if you're planning a wedding, I strongly endorse the approach of hiding in another country while all the hard decisions are made for you. <laughs> they just fly in the day before, fly back up, hassle free. <laughs> yeah. no bullshit. 
As for my career, other than that internship in MS-DOS, I matched the Dodge the x86 and the 16-bit mode entirely. While the 16-bit guys were feverishly working on Windows 95 on the other side of campus, we saw ourselves as the real priorities, working under Dave Cutler, who had just finished the VMS operating system in perfect hand-coded assembly language, and we produced real code in pure C for multiple platforms. In a somewhat ironic turn, I still didn't have a PC as my main machine, because I was assigned the job of porting the Win95 user interface over to RISC chips, and so I had a NIPS R4000 station instead. Working at Microsoft before and after my final semester at school led to something I think is entertaining, though it might have been a source of uh, annoyance to Dr. Hamilton at the time. I had run off before my fourth year to write major portions of the world's most popular operating system. I guess it's perhaps somewhat fitting that I work on MS-DOS came in between the introduction of operating systems and the advanced operating systems class. <laughs> if nothing else, if I wasn't the only guy in the operating systems class with a published device under his belt, I bet mine was the best seller. I spent the majority of my career in Windows MT, actually, which became Windows MT XP that it is now today Windows 10. I continued to write projects at home as well, which I'd sell as shareware. One such example was a product called Visual Tip that lets you treat compressed zip archives as if they were regular directories, browsing down inside of them, and so on. I was selling maybe a dozen copies a day when I received a call early one morning from Microsoft who was interested in purchasing Visual Zip for inclusion in the Windows operating system, and would I be interested in coming to talk about it? I hadn't left for work yet, so I asked what their office number was so I could stop by. Well, this led to some awkward confusion until we finally realized the person I was talking to didn't know that I already worked there. <laughs> they had just cold called the author of this program, who happened to be me at yeah. <laughs> We came to an agreement where Microsoft purchased Visual Set from me and we included it in the operating system. I'll abbreviate a long and complicated story to just say that when your options are take the deal or put your GL and compete with Microsoft, take the deal. <laughs> the Windows Task Manager you know that seen also began as it was another share app I wrote in my den that I was planning to sell inside, but when Dave Cutler saw it, he agreed to let me check it into the product, so I donated that one to the cause. Surprisingly, both Visual Dip and Task Manager are still alive and well in the product some 25 years later. A large part of my early work was to take all the code that's coming out of the Windows 95 and Windows 98 projects and rewrite it for NT. That meant taking code intended for the x86 processor running 8-bit anti-text in a home and making it ready for server level quality on a RISC machine with 16-bit Unicode text. Because care and byte are used interchangeably by those C programmers, it really means you're changing the assumption of how big a byte is and it becomes 16 bits, and almost all code breaks immediately. There were just dozens of other issues as well, like they assumed they broadcast out a small network while we went on TCP IP with long timeouts. So many things became entire architectural rewrites. Of course, on our behalf, we were totally immune from reality and being forced to be compatible with a million and of software titles going back to the 70s, not to mention operating with a lot fewer resources than we did. And so, you can imagine that your job is to take somebody else's code, tell them why you think it sucks, fix it properly, and give it back to them, which is what we did, day after day, week after month, some tensions developed between the teams. And then they merged those teams, which did not go so well. <laughs> so I wound up uh, heading off to move to the copy protection head up team, head up the copy protection team. I actually had a great course of booze here after I have a copy protection. It's true, I am the evil monster responsible for making you enter a product key in order to activate Windows. At least I'm the guy that's responsible for making sure two different people in the universe don't use the same key. There's two major tensions in such copy protection. You can't annoy the users, at least not any more than the bare minimum required, and you can't let normal, everyday people steal the product. And the worst case to me is annoying regular users without stealing the real power to them. I can't go into all the cool technical details of soft, soft, I can't even say soft modifying code that decrypts itself on the fly and all of that because I suppose it's all still trade secret. But suffice to say, I think it was almost 18 months before an easily pirated version of Windows XP actually hit the web. So in my mind, it, the protection was a great success. Well, on the side, I've been selling three small performance utilities for Windows, MemTurbo, NetTurbo, and a program called ClipTracker. On a good day, I might be sending out two dozen mailers, making a few extra hundred dollars that day. And then one day I discovered internet advertising. This was in the wild west days of pop-ups, no less. I was by no means the first, but my ads were very effective. When you're selling software on the internet, your two basic fundamental metrics are how much did it cost me in advertising and everything else to sell it, and how much did I earn? Computers are great about tracking these details. And in those very early days, I found that it cost about ten dollars to sell a program for fifty dollars. You just rinse and repeat as fast as often as you can. And so I bought millions of advertising impressions that ultimately became billions of impressions over time. The problem was that now, literally overnight, I was selling 1,000 copies a day. 
It sounds great, and it is great. But I had to come home after work, duplicate a thousand floppies, and I had to print a thousand mailers and a thousand disk kept tables. I had to get them assembled. There'd be about 2,500 emails to answer and 50 returns to process, and it was just me and my wife. And I had two kids and a dog and a rather demanding day job. So we hired friends and family to come in, put stickers on discs, and answer emails as fast as we could until we eventually got caught up. All this was making it rather hard to pay attention to my day job, but Microsoft was great, and they allowed me to take a three-month leave of absence to figure out what it was that I wanted to do with my life. And it turned out that what I really wanted to do at that young age, like a lot of people, was to make a lot of money and be my own boss. As a result, I turned my back on everything I'd come to love about my day job to focus on my side business, which was now the main business. As of this point, at least, I've never gone back to work another day for anyone else. Running your own busy software business is fun and exciting, and I had a great time doing it. I hand-wired every office for Cat5 and hand-terminated every cable myself because I wanted things just so. But in reality, I'd already worked for the world's biggest software company, and I didn't want to try and build a little clone of that. And to be honest, when I was pedaling my bike down here to the computer labs on Saturday morning as a kid, it wasn't because I wanted to manage a group of other productive kids. I wanted to program, to code, to figure stuff out, write hard logic that would impress myself and my friends. And that's how I wanted to spend my days, too, not with customers and program managers and lawyers. So, in addition to the uh, boring business side of the company, the live data reporting analysis and the AI systems that we built off my sales were fascinating. But in the end, like the company itself, it was all in the service of simply making money. My first attempt to retire away from it was to hire professional management, but that didn't go especially well. I ultimately decided to sell the business in its entirety to support.com down in California, and officially retired to sit around and write more fun code all day. There's a great book I recommend called Showstopper about the early development of Windows NT. In it, they discuss a conversation between a friend of mine, Bob Day, and his wife, and they're talking about what Bob Day really likes to do with his free time. Bob likes to code. Well, there must be something else he likes. Cars, maybe? Sports? Science fiction? No. Bob likes to code. And that's what Bob still does, too. And that's what I do as well, because I just love to code. So it's true, I get to spend more time with the family, and I travel a little bit, but mostly retirement meant that I get to write as much fun code as I want. To be fair, however, I also spend a lot of time restoring antique cars and I undertake a lot of mechanical projects like solar panels for my shop or this microcontroller control, 1500 horsepower twin turbo fuel injected and cool good luck engine that I built from cheap eBay parts. So I actually alternate. I code obsessively until I need a break and then I undertake some other projects in another discipline until I miss coding. Why the focus on writing new code? I think it's perhaps because that is the biggest difference between expectation and reality as a new programmer entering the workforce. As a student, you come to think that you'll be crafting great template libraries that drive some super complex production process with great elegance. But in your first years, you're really just tracking down an off by one string buffer error and some ancient client building code at the Saskatchewan Wheat Pool. Unless you wind up at a startup, and maybe even then, you'll start fixing other people's code. So your experience as a student of writing 95% new code becomes 95% debugging and maintaining other people's code. That will change over time as you gain experience, and debugging other people's mistakes is actually a great and effective way to develop that experience. And because I love to write new code as much as the next person, in the last couple of years, I will pick a project, whether it's writing shaders that look like natural water phenomena, or running my home automation. I'll start a new notebook, and I'll just start building. Anything I start like that has maybe a 20% chance of getting finished with a website and help files and all that, but I think that's still a pretty good ratio for someone in my position. The hardest and easiest part is finding information about what you're working on. By that I mean we have the blessing and curse of things like Stack Overflow, which can be a bit of a rough and tumble environment if you're new to a subject. If you can find the ear of an expert, you can learn a great deal quickly. But if your topic is too general, like the way you it's there to see you in the back. It can be a rough crowd on some days. My project this summer was to build a cool LED audio spectrum analyzer. Back in high school, John White had built one of discrete components like filters and op apps. And there was an entire daughter board assembled on top of the motherboard of this PEC 2001. But I was going to use strictly software and a modern microcontroller, and I wanted to do it all on one chip. The ESP has two cores, and they each run at 240 megahertz. So I have one core continually processing the math of FT, while the other core is continually drawing the display. As those cores are turning away, the chip wakes up some 44,000 times a second to sample the digital audio. The chip is really quite above its limits, and I love projects that do that. It's like when you get your washing machine working really hard on a cycle. If nobody else is home, I'll still jam the lid switch open and sit back and watch the machine at work, even at the age of 50, and I really have no idea why. Now, of course, a spectrum analyzer has been done before, and it'll be done again and again, because it's a cool and beautiful programming project, and when you're done, you wind up with a lot of desk-like lights. 
And the more death quick the lights in your life, the better. That almost brings us full, full circle, from a childhood of tinkering to a retirement of tinkering. Although advice wasn't really my goal, in summary, I will offer two little suggestions for those just entering the field. My first piece of advice, and it might even be bad advice financially, is simply that if you love coding, find a career path at a company that will let you code and advance until you've got it out of your system. Resist the temptation where you code only briefly before you start accumulating reports and management duties and living in meetings, unless that's what you really want. Dave Cutler is 76 years old. He's put in Microsoft in 30 years, which is his second job, and he still codes all day every day. My other is to find mentors. I learned a great deal from a small handful of great teachers and professors, and I imprinted on a few key people that were about my own age, give or take. But I never had an official industry mentor to lean on and to learn the ropes from during my career. It sounds obvious in any field, but I contend it's actually much more challenging in computer science because the people you really want to talk to may not be the chatty, outgoing, bullion folks you find yourself in the market. <laughs> they say there's a wide spectrum for people with Asperger's, and I think I'm likely somewhere around myself, although often what I like to call the non-visible part of the spectrum. But I don't think I'm alone in that. One of the guys on my team at Microsoft that actually won an Oscar for previous work at Pixel Art, but even he said they give out the technical Oscar Oscars on a different night, with no fanfare or red carpet or acceptance speeches. So that makes any opportunity to speak about a technical career all the more rare. For that, I am deeply grateful to you for your time tonight. I want to thank you all for coming out. very much, Dave, for that. That was enlightening. And uh, for those who don't know, Dave Plummer was one of the stars of my very first class at University of Regina. And uh, every assignment, I had a marker, but I had to check over all the marks. So I knew every assignment submitted by students. There were 21 students in the class. And there were two students, uh, Dave and Jeff Hamelock, who submitted the uh, just stellar assignments, just perfect each one. And Dave went on to do very well in the class. but. Uh, on the final exam, he got a question wrong, which he may still remember, because for about the next 10 years, every year he'd say, I've been coding on, you know, such and such version of the world's most popular uh, operating system, and I still don't know what Peterson's algorithm is. That was the question he got wrong on the exam. So, we're hoping to rectify that one day soon, and then Dave will know it all. But thank you very much, Dave, for coming and giving us that speech.